And the Speaker does have the power to evict a member of the House for disorderly behaviour. How many times have you had this very awkward opportunity of evicting a member of the House during your tenure? Uh, I'm not sure actually. At the beginning probably more than I should have and I think that was an experience. I, I try not to evict people from the House because I think it's important that all members should be there to fully participate. I run a fairly robust House uh, in the sense that I think uh, oppositions do have uh, the right to be able to contest decisions of government. I think government also of course has the right to respond and, and it's to get the balance um, between the two. So in recent times not so many, though having said that last week I did ask two members to remove themselves from the House. <laughs> so it comes and goes. Um, more than two thirds of Parliament is non-Christian. So why then does Parliament begin its day with a Christian prayer? Um, apparently Dr Wayne Mapp, the political correctness eradicator, speaking on our programme, said that Parliament should reflect its diverse composition and having a universal prayer that acknowledges the faith of all its groups. What do you have to say on that point? I think that's right, and of course as was pointed out uh, to me, even in a Christian sense, the prayer is fairly exclusive, say, of Catholics. Right. Um, it, it comes very much out of an Anglican uh, tradition, so it's even narrow construed with, within the Christian context. Uh, however, Parliament on many things is quite conservative, so I, I'll be very interested to see whether members are prepared to see the reflection or not in that. I mean, there are some also who say, why do we have a prayer at all? Because they don't subscribe to any faith. Uh, I'm not of that view. I, I think starting the day um, with what could be called a prayer or a thought um, is actually Some entirely sort of appropriate. Beauty. Absolutely. And, but I do feel it should be inclusive. But that's a purely personal view. And um, the Speaker doesn't make the rules. They'll have to come with the agreement of all the parties. Potential change. Effect, Potential yeah. change. It comes up from time to time. And I think it's now more urgent than perhaps it was before. Just for the reasons you've said, the changing nature of New Zealand society, its parliament should be reflective of that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rodney Hyde, I'm the MP for Epsom, I'm the leader of the ACT Party, and you're watching me on Darpen TV Triangle. Keep watching. Um, with the image of MPs at a bit of a low ebb, particularly with you know the um, prolivity of media that, that is available, everyone is now has the opportunity to see what goes on in the House. Um, some of the MPs swearing, throwing fingers, falling asleep during debates. How do you manage to keep an eye on what's going on and do you find that quite stressful? Well, I think it, you have to fully concentrate and the truth is you don't hear and see everything because you can't be everywhere in, in a way. You can uh, pick up on quite a lot, but uh, for instance I didn't see um, Mr. Mark's gesture the, the other day. Um, I sometimes didn't hear also when someone makes a non-parliamentary comment. But the rules do say someone else can raise the issue and then the procedure is I ask the member if that's what they said or did and if they uh, say that then I ask them to withdraw and apologise uh, if offence is taken. And I think that probably is the best way to do it. And members are very quick to, to, uh, yes, well, to, to maintain, if you like, um, that order in that sense, and it's my job to make sure it is after that. So it's, um, it's just full concentration all the time on yeah. what's happening. What do you say to the members of the public and uh, political fraternity who strongly believe that you've let them down by not allowing national parties move to refer Philip Toto Field's conduct to the House Privileges Committee? Um, is it because you feared that Tito Field might walk out of the caucus, therefore depriving Labour of its one-seat margin over national, or are there other reasons behind that? No, the political considerations never came into it and it would have been entirely inappropriate. Um, what did come into it, of course, and what the Speaker must do, is look to see what standing orders say, to look to see what, of any, precedents there would be, and then to construe the standing orders on the facts. And it is the facts, not that the Speaker investigates, but the facts that are presented to the Speaker by whoever's making the complaint. I take advice on that um, from, from the Clerk of the House. 
and both of us uh, came to to that conclusion that it uh, in this particular instance it wasn't in standing orders because it wasn't a matter that had happened within the house. I know that's been criticised as being a very narrow interpretation but I just want people to think if you'd given a broad interpretation then the Speaker would in effect be giving members of Parliament immunity. In other words, they would be saying in a way they the law doesn't apply to them, so any other laws that might have applied wouldn't. So that's why Speakers have always traditionally construed that privileges, and these are privileges that members have. They, the obvious one, they can say anything they like about anyone in Parliament and it won't be defamation. Right. Um, so, so, so your decision was strictly within the rules And had to be. Had to be in the rules of the House because otherwise it's not just in this instance but you'd be creating a precedent of giving members rights that historically they've never had. And one would question whether, they sh whether members of Parliament should be treated any differently than any other citizen outside the confines of the activities of Parliament. Do you feel that this was a situation where Parliament's reputation required maybe something more of yourself as the Speaker, um, so that you know where the House can be a law unto itself? Well, I think that's what I was trying to. I took the unusual step. Normally, the Speaker just says yes, this is to the Privileges Committee or not. I took the unusual step of giving reasons in the House um, for my decision. And because I thought the matter was a serious one, it's why I did suggest to the members that yes, there was another way through, and that was with a code of conduct, which happens to be that um, matter before the Standing Orders Committee at this very moment. Right. And therefore, while the privileges, uh, I firmly believe, is not the way to go, and I think uh, if people really understand what a privilege is in this context, they'd agree with that. But if you were seeking another way to, to be able to, for Parliament to express its views, then it had an opportunity before it at this moment in the Code of Conduct. And uh, that's why I expressed that view that, that I thought that was the route that should be gone. Now, that hasn't been taken up yet, but who knows what happens in the future. And how does it feel for yourself having someone put a forward a vote of no confidence in yourself? Has that shaken you or has that made you more determined in your role to, to stay firm to your role? Well, I think one is always um, reflective and, and self-critical, and certainly if I'd um, felt that the decision hadn't been a correct one, and I think with a bit of reflection, most people who know anything with respect about privilege have, have said yes, it was the right um, decision. So therefore, the, the vote of no confidence, um, uh, I have to see in the more political context, if you like, than in the context of not being able to do the job. So really the vote of no confidence in a sense it was for doing the job <laughs> right. therefore I don't actually feel um, so You don't think it's set at some sort of dangerous precedent where maybe members feel that they can do what they like and, and not come up with Well I think they will and, and I think that's the test for the speaker is whether the speaker is intimidated or harassed by a particular faction in Parliament um, saying I'm going to bring a vote of no confidence in you and, uh, and therefore I think it's important to stick to the rules even though that uh, harassment might be taking place. How difficult was it for you um, on another not so uh, far away contentious issue when the big debates about David Benson Pope were going on? How hard was it to keep control in the House at that point? Well again I think it's a, it's a bit of politics really and, and one um, tried and uh, to be as fair and as impartial as, as one humanly can and and I think in the heat of the moment with politics things arise and seem extremely important uh, created facts are very rarely uh, fully on the table at the time and I think as subsequent facts probably showed that um, uh, the behaviours of um, Mr Benson Pope uh, were probably those of many other teachers at that time in that context yep. in, in a way and the police inquiry etc demonstrated there wasn't anything to be pursued there so it's it's very difficult not to get carried away I think just because the there's a lot of pressure and, and pull it back to what's your job and your job is to apply the standing orders and just because lots of pressure is put on you by one party or another doesn't necessarily make it right. That would be the easy decision 
Right. The easy decision would be to give in and, and say, oh yes, it should go to the Privileges Committee. But on reflection, as is happening, when people actually looked at all the facts, they'd say, why on earth did she do that? So I prefer to, to take the long-term view of the judgment, not, not the short-term.